It's lovely. Well, before I start, I just want to say to Ada, that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That was amazing. Um, and I just do a quick intro. I'm Alice. I live in Birmingham. Like a lot of people here today, it seems. Um, and this talk is just sort of a presentation of some of the ideas I'm researching at the moment. It's by no means complete still in the very early stages and I'm not really talking a lot about any references that I'll be making, any sort of books or academic references. So if you do want any of those, just send me a message at the end or a question and I will get back to you. Um, and also thank you for Queer Disrupt for letting me speak today. I'm very excited about it and very excited to be speaking alongside some really cool, interesting people. Um, so my paper, as you can see, is called The Future of Memory, Archives as Radical Praxis. I intend this to be a very open-ended discussion for the purpose of us all to interrogate our own personal relationships with archives, if we even have one at all, that is. Um, so there are no answers, there is no conclusion or solution to some of the questions I'll be raising. Instead, I'd like this to talk, for this talk to be simply a consideration of what the future holds for queer memory, history and archival strategy. So I thought I'd begin with just a brief uh, understanding of what is an archive. I would describe a conventional archive from a Western historiographical perspective as a space within which culturally significant documentation is collected and preserved. This archival format was developed in the early modern period where the increasing need to record administrative and legal documentation began to arise. Contemporary archives, as you might find in your local council or government building, continue to, find, uh, continue to follow such institutional documentation focused structure, though now also encompass a wider range of ephemera, so photos, videos, clothes, and other such things, for example. Fundamentally, archives must provide a framework of accountability for sociocultural affairs, Darnell Elmore claims in his essay, Structurelessness, Structure and Queer Movement, which I very much recommend. Um, and similarly, Michel Foucault describes archives as the law of what can be said. Um, so some queer archives do follow this conventional structure too. Unfortunately, a lot of what I'm talking about in this uh, discussion today is very America focused, so I am sorry for that. But three great well-known examples of traditionally structured archives, um, queer archives in particular, are the one National Gay and Lesbian Archives, the Lesbian Her Story Archives, and slightly more modern in its approach is LGBT history on Instagram. Um, now by queer archive, I'm talking about an archival space that collects, preserves, and maybe exhibits queer historical ephemera. These spaces are necessary. Not only do they provide somewhat consistent access to pertinent historical records, but they also offer an important didactic service um, for their target community or communities. Queer archives in particular reflect the urgency of knowledge preservation and sharing as a means not to forget turbulent histories. Um, for academics, they're some of the most fruitful resources for engaging with queer history. I, for one, love archives. I love going to archives, I love visiting them. Being surrounded by that wealth of resources is really valuable, I think, to all people. Um, yeah, and they are just truly invaluable devices for preserving the future of memory. Um, but for more radical queers, I would like to argue that archives could be more. They can be spaces for world building, storytelling, or just a creative device for the purpose of preserving the future of memory. Um, today's archives are victim of historic censorship laws, ever-changing cultural priorities, and the ineffable barriers of personal shame. Um, so when combined with the contemporary heuristics of uh, institutional neoliberalism, archives really do fail to provide a meaningful space for queer histories to thrive, um, which is why I believe we must create additional space away from this format. Archives are inherently flawed institutions after all. They're not just encyclopedic repositories of information, but they are spaces contingent or built upon even the dominant structures of hegemony and prejudice, particularly in the West. Um, so further to collect, preserve and study all meaningful objects would just be a Sisyphean task, um, even without the job of deciding what is and is not of historical value. It just seems an impossible, inevitable, inevitably failing task to archive everything. 
So how can we alter this old fashioned archival structure, you might ask? Uh, I would like to suggest looking to the four key pillars of archival structure um, on your screens now that I borrow from Anne Svekovic's archival research. Um, I've shown there that the YouTube video that I found this on, it's really amazing. It's like an hour and a half long though, so maybe put it on double speed. Um, these four pillars cover the basis of commercial archive structure, and they are a little self-explanatory, but I'll just give a brief overview of what they are so we're all at the same speed. Um, so collecting is the process of gathering archival resources. This might be legal documentation, medical records, posters, pin badges, clothes, photographs and videos. Classifying is the act of naming, describing and ordering items within an archive. So asking questions like, what is this object called? When was it created or when did it become relevant? Who is it for? What keyword should we use to document it in the archival records and so forth? Researching is very similar to classifying and involves gathering information surrounding artifacts and objects, um, sometimes done through oral history projects, cross-examination, but most commonly it would be academic input. Um, and finally, exhibiting. This doesn't always happen, but when it does, this would be the preservation, uh, presentation sorry, of archival resources or duplicates of these resources, either publicly or privately. Um, this could be in a history museum, an art gallery, a library, um, you get a picture. And, you know, following this specific rigid structure, these four pillars seems to be a very sensible, straightforward way of doing archives. But of course, there are myriad flaws um, in this structure. So issues of censorship, both public and private, come up. Issues of consent, of safety, accessibility, fluidity and community are all, all things that will arise when we use this rigid framework. Um, so, you know, what might the solution be? Uh, contemporary archival projects, so Instagram's LGBT history, as I previously mentioned, and also the Switchboard Logbooks podcast series, if any of you have seen that it's on Spotify. Um, these in particular are doing the groundwork for developing a really new and liberating um, archival practice for queers. They're championing queer voices, um, attaining the correct and authentic rights for their resources, which is super important, and providing space for communities to join and see history as it's made, really. Um, unfortunately, they do both maintain this traditional structure of archival framework. Uh, with a little space for sort of experimental retellings of history, world building and um, just queer creativity in general. So an alternative uh, for this is what I would like to call a radical queer archive. It's not a new phrase at all, um, but and of course it's a bit of a contradiction. So uh, if you can see the full quote, it's on the board, but Fortunately for me, Lisa Darms has already explained why the uh, contradiction of Radical Archive is uh, not too bad at all. I won't read the whole thing because it's a bit long, but she says, uh, the drives for both ceaseless change and preservation seem irreconcilable, but radical also means fundamental. The word radical therefore encompasses both permanence and fixity, as well as fluidity and change, as much as the phrase Radical Archives itself does. It's this fluidity and change that I'm interested in. Um, so another quote from Darnell L. Moore reminds us that the queerness, that queerness is an antagonistic process to order and regulation. Therefore, queer archiving should be an act that fully embodies queerness, rejecting assimilation, challenging dominant modes of history making and keeping, engaging with queer creativity does after all allow a greater understanding of what defines queer, both emotionally and socio-politically. So in this sense, a queered archive is not one that primarily focuses on LGBTQ histories, uh, but rather is one that disrupts the framework for archives in an attempt to create a more dynamic, challenging and experimental space, thus being queered. Of course, this archive does have potential to be more inclusive and engaging for queer communities and histories, but that's not necessarily the sole intent uh, of a queer archive, as I am speaking of it. Um, yeah, so what does Queer Archive actually look like, you might be wondering. Um, well, Andrea Zafrino and Mel Hogan offer what I believe to be one of the more compelling arguments, which is they suggest it to be something that is alive, 
open to mutations and unreliable as a linear narrative. Um, this Living Queer Archive is not a one-sided repository of information, but a space of mutual communication. The archive's ability to mutate invites the challenge of material or linguistic difference. It's inclusive of myriad cultures, identities and histories, embracing fiction and rumour too. Uh, with no recognisable chronology, a queer archive is not seeking to assimilate into these conventional archive formats as previously discussed, or prioritise the value of particular ephemera or peoples. This must mean that it issues standard collection systems, placing precedence on an embodied, creative retelling of history and encompasses uh, challenging perspectives that might not be commonly acknowledged in dominant narratives. Um, a little aside to that, which I won't be discussing, is if you are interested in archives that challenge dominant narratives, I would wholeheartedly recommend taking a look into Fred Wilson's Mining Museum installation from 1992. It's amazing and basically inspired the whole backbone of this research for me. So do look into that if you are curious. Um, but moving on to some examples that I will be showing today, um, as you can see on the board, or screen, I should say. Um, I'm not sure that I found the perfect example of a queered archival practice yet. Um, and that's not to say some incredible examples of queered archives don't exist. Rather than give countless examples or theoretical frameworks and bore you all, I thought I'd like to talk through these three creations that challenge something in the structure of collecting, classifying, researching and exhibiting. Um, most examples I'll be showing today don't refer to themselves as archives or queer for that matter, um, but do collect or display information as though they might be. Um, so what I'd, what they choose to do with the information, sorry, uh, or how it's been responded to is where I'd like to look and hopefully find some exciting avenues for the future of memory and queer archival practice in general. So this is the first piece. Uh, I'll, I'll be sort of talking about collecting and exhibiting as two pillars of archival strategy, archival strategy, sorry, with this piece. Um, so initially published as a nondescript advert in the independent magazine of Fandangos, Hyrin Frinfinson's artwork stated, I collect personal secrets. Please send yours to me. I'm looking forward to learning them and I will keep them carefully, which I've now just realized rhymes. That's nice. Um, uh, this is alongside a postal address. So multiple adverts of the same poem, I guess. Um, and 40 years later, the artist had amassed hundreds of responses uh, in the shape of well-packaged secrets. Uh, having made a promise to never read a single response, Frinfinson's project came to its end in 2015. Uh, and in order to secure the security of his collected confessions, all secrets were shredded and their scraps transformed into this indecipherable, heavily textured square collage, uh, which this image depicts. Through the shredded paper, the occasional legible word can be seen, though no full sentence, name or secret is visible. Um, marking the culmination of the project, the singular piece is now the only known remnant of hundreds of anonymous secrets. Um, so what interests me about this project is the mode of collection that the artist shows. The call for secrets specifically ignites a sense of shame, fear, even naughtiness that is often absent from the conventional documents or objects collected by an archive. Uh, as keynote speaker Heather Love claims, a genealogy of queer affect that does not overlook the negative, shameful and difficult feelings that have been so central to queer existence in the last century is essential for innovative archival work. It may seem unconventional, counterproductive even, um, but to write down a shameful secret or a piece of information that is solely yours is an inherently archival act. Um, I find the final piece to be emblematic of what all personal archives should be, uh, fluid. Truths change, grow and evolve as time passes by. What might be a secret, a fact or a reality one day might not be the case later on. What we're, see we're seeing the transience of memory here and its fluid nature. Further, by collecting these secrets, the artist is liberating the donors to choose whether they would like to be involved in the archive, which differs from many conventional archives in that it requires active consent. Such consent helps the archive feel embodied and meaningful beyond its usefulness. 
Um, so following on from this, another piece that uses a consensual collection method is wefeelfine.org, a post-internet artwork authored by everyone, which was conceived by Jonathan Harris and C. Pandar Kambar in August 2005. The artwork functions, uh, it claims, by harvesting human feelings from web blogs through bot controlled web searches of the phrases I feel and I am feeling. It's essentially a data mine as we would know it in today's words. Um, when such phrases are found, the bot records the full sentence and categorizes the emotion, author, and geographical location from the blog which it was taken. As of 2006, the database consisted of several million independent figures and images which were all searchable through the website interface before Flash Media Player became defunct at the start of this year, I think. So now the website is unusable unless you have Flash installed. Um, but yeah, the, the, the information does not include any name, location or age of any individual involved, uh, should you find a way to access it. Um, this piece is interesting for me for its method of classifying, as I've already said. Uh, it collected information found publicly online with its sole intention to see how everyone was feeling, really, that was it. Its concern wasn't really with the objective truth, but with emotive responses from anonymous people who chose to share their feelings consensually online. Um, such emotional retellings of personal feelings create a sense of world building within the site, even without the intimate details. Of course, this does little to assure that the space is provided for communities often excluded from conventional archives, which is a major problem. Um, but through the anonymization of all contributions, there is no obvious hierarchy in place, um, which I guess is a, a partial solution to that. Um, all emotions, feelings and sensations uh, are valued equally and classified solely based on their surface value. Again, this may appear counterproductive. Um, for the purpose of an archive, but this universalization of emotive or affective experience is no different to the universalization of other personal attributes. Um, so when I would say when we champion this emotional classification structure, um, we're unifying people beyond their social stature, their accomplishments and failures and so forth. Um, so this alteration of the standard archival method is, you know, therefore very useful for queers um, and it challenges the hierarchy we often find ourselves in, both inside and outside of archives. Uh, so moving swiftly on to researching, this is the final piece I will show you today because uh, I am anxious about time. Um, this is Zoe Leonard's Bay Richards photo archive. Um, and it is the only piece that I am showing or have really seen that fits into my research that is a self-proclaimed archive. Um, you might already know Zoe Leonard, she's quite famous for her really incredible, very well-known poem, I Want a Dyke for a President, uh, just amazing. Um, so this archive is another piece of her work. Um, which was made in collaboration with Cheryl Dunyay, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, and comprises of 82 photographs documenting the life of Faye, who is a black lesbian actress and blues singer. It follows her through teenhood, stardom, civil rights era, workplace racism, and elderly life eventually. Uh, visually and method methodologically, this follows a very normative conventional archival structure but the focus of the archive, or the sole reason um, for its existence, Faye Richards, uh, doesn't actually exist. Uh, Faye is a fictional amalgamation of girls and women whose lives may have followed a similar trajectory or may have been completely different. Um, Leonard's intention with this archive was to create an entirely fictitious life, but one that rang true of black womanhood experiences that were being lived in the mid nineties and earlier, um, and recognizes the absence of black womanhood from dominant narratives, um, including within archives. Um, a full casting list of the hired women uh, in this project, so the women that you see in the photographs um, is included in the work. So that's 
a very good thing that you don't often find. Um, and this was Zoe's intention um, to sort of try and end the cycle of forgotten black women in history. This is probably one of my favorite examples of sort of archival disruption or archival queering. Um, and it's solely because it's just full of lies. It's just full of lies. Um, it's just like reading a story that you know is fake and it's so nice to do that once in a while. Um, but yeah, Alex, I mean- Just to say well, you have a few minutes left. That's cool, I'm nearly done, I'm nearly done. Um, so yeah, what I take away from this piece is that really in, when we're speaking of queer history and you know wider counter-public archives in general, we really just have to make it up. Um, queer history has been so neglected until very, very recently. Much of it's censored, hidden, manipulated, or forgotten, um, especially that of women, and co women of colour. Um, so to fill in the gaps, we really just should make it up um, and there's no harm in that. Uh, the idea of creating fantasy or a story or a new world is what queerness has been built upon. So much of our history is lies, rumour, deceit, or some elaborate facade we've collectively decided to believe. So much of our lives, particularly those of us who are queer, um, have been formed by the lies we've told and the fantasies we've created and the worlds we have built within ourselves. Uh, also, as the only openly lesbian creative that I'm discussing today, Zoe Leonard has really exemplified the successes of radically queering the conventional archival method for the benefit of its own community. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, this is all I had time for, as you are aware. Um, and though there are so many examples of queer archival practice, uh, I invite you, that I've missed, I invite you to leave this talk without a solid understanding of uh, what queer archives of the future might look like, but hopefully with an interest in what they could become. Uh, ultimately, I wanted for this talk to have been useful to radical queers trying to create radical new means of history preservation. Preserving our memory is super important, but the need to assimilate into this traditional archival method just isn't necessary. If you find pieces of memory or history within something, let it be an archive and let it teach you something. Thank you.